just going to wait for um, people to join, and we're going to, of course, wait for um, Dr. Youngenberg to join. I'm really excited by this live. I think this is going to be a lot of fun, and it's going to be really informative. Um, I see some of my followers are joining, and okay, I see Dr. Six just joined. So... Hey, hey, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Perfect. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm doing really well. Thanks. I just want to wait for a few more people to join. How's your day? Pretty good. Busy clinic, but it's over now. Busy. I was following your stories today, all the surgeries that you were doing. Thank you. Okay, so I just, I want to give a really brief introduction about you. It'll be very brief because we're going to really get into it and you'll be able to speak better to your experience and your expertise. But I just wanted to start off by saying that you are one of the leading plastic surgery surgeons in Canada. Thank you. Um, what I think was so interesting for me, what I discovered about you was that you have this incredible model where you do the plastic surgery at one of the most famous hotels in Canada, which is the Royal York. And I had the opportunity to go there to visit you um, to give an empathy seminar, which we'll talk about soon. Um, but I also thought it was really cool that you actually travel around the world doing plastic surgery. So you're in Dubai, you're in Kuwait, you're all around the world, which I think is really impressive and interesting. And I don't know many doctors who do that. So, um, but luckily enough, you're in Toronto. And um, we have the opportunity tonight to talk to you a little bit about plastic surgery and beauty and empathy. So um, thank you for, for joining us for this, uh, for this live. Oh, thanks for having me. Absolutely. So let's just get right into it. Why did you become a plastic surgeon? I know that you were an amazing student. I know that about you. Uh, you could have chosen any specialty, but you chose plastic surgery. Why plastic surgery? Simple answer is my dad. My dad was a plastic surgeon, so when I was growing up, um, you know, I looked up to him. He was my role model. Um, I got to see what he did, and I I met some of his patients, and I remember meeting them, and just the, the impact that had on me really affected me. Like you know, they're, they're, you are who you are. Sort of, it's a combination of experiences in life, but there are certain events in your life that sort of really, really shape you. And there were there are a few specific things in my childhood that really sort of steered me in that direction. I remember meeting a, just walking down the street, coming home from school with my dad, and we met a patient of his, and my dad told me a story. He was a truck driver, he was in a car accident, and my dad saved his hand by implanting it in his stomach just to save it, to salvage it. I was like, wow, that's just so weird. I was, I was like, wow. And then there, there were a few other instances like this when I met his patients, and I was very, very impressed by what he was able to do for his patients and, and the reaction he was getting from his patients. So I, you know, being influenced, I, I grew up wanting to be a doctor like my dad, being a plastic surgeon like my dad. It wasn't though until uh, grade 11 when I was here in Canada, um, new immigrant to Canada, barely spoke any English, and I was doing grade 11 biology. And I swear, when the teacher was talking to us, I thought he was speaking Latin. Like all the medical terms, I couldn't understand what it was. I was, I was so shocking. But then when I got my first exam back, I did really well, I got 90 or something. And I got like, oh, maybe I'm good at this. And it kind of reignited my interest in, in medicine. And so from grade 11 on, uh, I spent pretty much every summer working in a hospital, pretty much laser focused on getting to medical school and, and plastic surgery and, and made my way through. And here I am now doing what I do. I know that there's a story connected to your mom that you told me when I first met you. Do you want to share that story? Because I think it's just a very touching story. So my mom was a high school teacher. Um, and so I, I think my my interest in teaching and helping other people kind of comes from my mom. Um, a, a lot of what I do now, aside, you know, so the, the side of plastic surgery, especially social media, is uh, is education-based. I, I, I'm very active on social media. Um, people may know me as Dr. Six on social media. And and the the purpose of what I do is to help educate people. I really believe in in helping people understand what they're getting into. Uh, one of the major concepts in healthcare medicine is informed consent. Patients have to consent to what they're doing. And I'm a very visual person. I like to see things. Instead of reading about them, I like to see them. And I find that by showing people and teaching them what plastic surgery is, what we do, they 
better able to understand what they're really getting into. And so I truly believe that our patients are the best informed patients and are making a truly informed consent when they decide to proceed with surgery. We, we don't just show before and afters. I'm not just doing a, a, a showing off my work. When, when, I, when I show what I do, I show people the whole process from the consultation to the procedure to recovery. I show all the nitty gritty. I show them when they're bruised, when they're swollen, when they look all that pretty. And I explain to people what, what's going on. And what's really important these days is explaining what's possible, what is not. We live in a world of filters, Photoshop, deep fakes. There's a lot of unrealistic expectations, and that's like probably the biggest educational topic I deal with every day with my patients is setting realistic expectations. And my work in social media helps me to do that because I can really show real plastic surgery. Like I tell people, this is real plastic surgery, not reality TV when it's all staged and made to look like it's real, but it's not. Right. Okay. So t- tell me a bit about the type of procedures that you do at your clinic, because I know different plastic surgeons specialize in different things. What do you specialize in? So when I started out, my goal was to be a cancer reconstructive microsurgeon. I did a, I did my plastic surgery residency, and then I went and I did additional training in New York in cancer micro uh, microsurgery, and I loved doing that. Um, however, as my practice evolved, I sort of transformed, and now I'm 100% cosmetic. I do I do full range of cosmetic surgeries, uh, moment makeovers, breast augmentations, uh, facelifts. Uh, pretty much the entire body, except for the nose. The noses, I leave those for a rhinoplasty specialist. Mm-hmm. Okay, interesting. Um, tell me, what is the most common myth that people have about plastic surgery? And I'd love you to debunk it for us. Probably is the motivation that people have. I think people people that don't have plastic surgery, don't know many who have plastic surgery, misunderstand what it's all about. They probably think that people that seek out plastic surgery have body dysmorphic disorder, or have some psychological issues that they're trying to address. And that could be further from the truth. Now, I, I don't mean to say that body dysmorphic disorder is not a real thing. It's absolutely a real thing. But it represents a very, very tiny proportion of patients we see. And we understand this is not something plastic surgery can actually help treat. And we turn those patients away. We, we do not treat patients that have body dysmorphic disorder. Your typical patient, uh, predominantly, you know, we have a lot of women, some men as well, but mostly women, um, women who want to tweak something about their bodies, post-pregnancy changes, trying to reverse things that simply diet and exercise will never help with. These are people that just like want to feel better in their bodies, want to feel more confident in their bodies, but they don't really have any psychological issues as most people would assume they would. Okay, interesting. Um, so one of the things that I've noticed from following you now on Instagram is that you're really one to speak your mind. <laughs> you go on these kind of these rants on social media, which I actually really enjoy because I feel like I'm really sort of getting to know you, the person behind the, the doctor. What's one thing about your field of expertise that no, almost no one agrees with you about? Um, well, probably there's more than just one. <laughs> uh, I guess when I started out, you know, I was one of the very first people to use social media to educate. And when I first started back in 2016, uh, being very active on social media, this was really frowned upon. Like a lot of other surgeons kind of looked down at this as being something horrific, unprofessional, really, really bad and evil. But things have changed. And I think most of those people are now doing the same things. Um, when it comes to sort of plastic surgery specific, um, I think I'm known for my what I would call tiny scar breast augmentations. And I'm able to do this because I use sealing breast implants. And sealing breast implants are not very popular with other surgeons. Most other plastic surgeons use silicone breast implants, which are great, nothing wrong with them. But I love using sealing breast implants because ultimately it's just a filler. Um, it has a lot of benefits, which I find outweigh the benefits of silicone breast implants. And so I think in that aspect, in that I use a lot of sealing breast implants, kind of makes me a little bit unique compared to other plastic surgeons. Okay. Interesting. Um, we, we met because of empathy. So I came in to, um, to your clinic, to the Royal York, to do an empathy seminar for the doctors and the nurses and all the administrative staff. Um, a couple of people told me that it was, you know, you made it compulsory that everyone attend. Even someone came in on their day off. One of your nurses, Kim, also Kim. Um, tell me, why did you feel the, um, the, the need to do this seminar? Like, why was it important for you to do an empathy seminar at your clinic? Because we don't often associate plastic surgery with empathy. Tell me about your thinking of bringing me in to do that for you guys. I think from very early on, I understood the importance of 
good patient care and customer service. I realize that what we do is not life and death. What we do is elective surgery. Um, and so there's more of a customer service aspect to what we do. Unlike all the kind of procedures, uh, it, I think it is important that we we do more than just good medicine. Uh, I, I understand that no matter how good of a job I can do to create a good result, um, how patients feel really impacts how happy they are with the results. And I understand from personal experience that customer service is important. When I go to places where there's great customer service, I go like, wow, I just feel like a million bucks. And I'd like my patients to feel the same way. So that has been an important aspect of our practice. I've been, uh, I've been emphasizing patient care to my, to, my, to my staff and we've had other sessions. And recently I came across your empathy um, topics and empathy is something I haven't thought of before. So it was more like an eye opener for me, like, wow, oh, this is interesting. And we've spoken, I've kind of looked into it a little bit more and I thought this is, this is really, really relevant. This is really, really helpful. And so I invited you to come and do a seminar for us and teach us about empathy to help us elevate our customer service and patient care to the next level. And I made it compulsory because I feel every single person in our, in our, in our clinic needs to know about this. This is not just me. This should be the entire team that's looking after our patients. Every single member of my team should make our patients feel like a million bucks. So it is thank, part thank of your you. culture. Thank like someone, someone just wrote that. One yeah. of the the comments was just that 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 they feel that when they walk into your clinic, that sense of empathy. So I think you really have integrated it, you know, into the culture um, and the practice of your of your clinic. That's that's what a lot of your your patients say. Um, I want to talk to you about your work, um, okay. and I I don't want you to be modest. <laughs> I want you to just you know, just tell us exactly what you think. Do you think that your, um, you know, your ability to really excel in plastic surgery, do you think it's, it was technical? Is it medical? Is it artistic? Cause I do think that there is a, a lot of artist artistry to what you do when I'm watching your surgeries, like on Instagram live and stuff, there is like the meeting almost of medicine and art. Um, what is it? Is is it a combination of these things? Like, what makes you so good at what you do? Um, I think that it's it's a lot of aspects of my personality. Um, I I am a perfectionist, and I don't mean like you know stereotypical perfectionist. I'm a perfectionist in that I'm never satisfied with what I do. I always I'm always trying to make it better. I'm always thinking how I can make something better, improve things. I think about what I do. Um, I think what differentiates me from some other surgeons is that some surgeons go to school, learn certain things, and then they practice that type of surgery for the rest of their life. This is how it's been done. That's, that's a textbook way. I, I'm always trying to innovate, always trying to think, how can I make this a little better? What can I, what can I change? How can we be more efficient? Um, how can we make it better, safer, faster, nicer? Um, there, there's, I guess, self-criticism. I'm always, uh, I'm always competing against myself. How can I be better than I was yesterday? Right. Um, um, so right. It's, it's, it's this constant drive. It's, it's this constant drive to keep pushing forward and never be satisfied. The other thing, too, is the, the whole notion of having your clinic and performing the surgery in a hotel. Like, where did you come up with that idea? Um, it, was a, it was a bit of a fluke. When I graduated, um, there was a, a plastic surgeon, Dr. Silver, who actually had a clinic at Royal York. And I went to observe him just to see how he knew he does it and watched him do amazing facelifts and brow lifts. And then he retired and the clinic got shut down. And I was working uh, at another place, uh, another great plastic surgeon, Dr. List. I was working there. And then when I decided to leave, I started to look for a place and I was looking all around the city. And my real estate agent said, hey, I got something for you. And he took me to Royal York. And I'm like, oh, I'm taking it. I got it. Um, and, I, and I took it because I thought it was a beautiful location. It, being European, I felt very much at home in this beautiful building. What I didn't realize at the time is what an amazing location it is. That location has so many pluses. Um, being located inside a family or your hotel, in a, in a little secluded area, so we're private, nobody sees us, there's no hotel guests, but we're in a private area. But we have the hotel as our facility. So when my patients are finished with their surgery, we can just wheel them upstairs to one of the hotel rooms to recover. Um, so I tell patients, we have the world's largest, most luxurious private hospital. I have a limitless number of recovery rooms. The beauty is that patients are in the hotel room, so if there's anything, you can call us down. My nurses can go up there. I can go up there if there's any urgency. Uh, they sleep overnight. Then we go upstairs the next morning, check on them. 
Um, the convenience, the safety is phenomenal. Uh, and the location, it's its central Toronto, so it's easy for our patients to get there, whether they drive, whether they take their GO train or whether they come from the airport. We have a lot of people traveling from around the world and they can fly to Pearson or Billy Bishop and both airports have shuttles that come right to Royal York. So for transportations, it's phenomenal. And it's a beautiful place. Yeah, I, I just, I love going to work in that place. Yeah, no, it is beautiful. It's it's it has a sense of grand grandeur. You know, it's it's very it's very regal to to step into that place. Um, in terms of like the personality of a surgeon, people associate surgeons with a specific personality. Do you think plastic surgeons like fit this bill, or do you think they're a little bit unique in terms of the profile of a plastic surgeon? Of course, you're all unique, but what do you think the uh, the, the most successful plastic surgeries have in terms of personality traits? So I, I would agree, yes, that there is a surgeon personality. If you're in medicine, you would notice there's the internist, there's the surgeons, there's the, the psychiatrists, like diff very different personalities. When it comes to surgery, a plastic surgeon in specific, um, I think most plastic surgeons have a, have a bit of an aesthetic sense to it. A lot of, lot of us have doodled in art or have some artistic background, and, and we like to combine art and science. There's the scientific part of how you do the surgery, how you cut, how you make things heal, but there's also the the artistic thing of how you put it together because every surgeon knows things a little bit differently. You know, something as simple as a breast augmentation. You put 10 plastic surgeons side by side, they all do the exact same procedure. They all will get slightly different results because they do things a little bit differently with a different aesthetic eye, a different surgical technique. Um, in, in, you know, to, to answer your question, in, in what makes a plastic surgeon successful, I think uh, it is a, it's, a, it's a great combination of the scientific aspect and a nice mix of art to combine, to personalize it, to be able to connect with patients and create the results that patients want. Because creating a breast augmentation to fit a certain patient is a different type of a surgery than doing an appendectomy for another patient. It's appy, 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 you know, it's very, very similar, very, you know, almost like mechanical. Cosmetic surgery is a lot more artistic, a lot more individualized. Do you think that you have a specific style of plastic surgery or is your style really all about listening to what the patient wants and then adapting it to, to the patient's uh, desire for the picture they have? Well, I think I, I think what has helped me su to succeed and makes me a little bit different from other people is that I realized very early on that I am not here to impose my style or my views on the patients. Uh, I find a lot of plastic surgeons go through residency and learn how to do things. This is how a breast should look. This is how a thumb duck should look. And they try to do this and, and tell patients what, what is the right or wrong. It almost feels like a duty. You are the doctor, you know, and you tell patients what's right or wrong. Um, one or two years into my practice, I did a breast augmentation on a patient and I did a beautiful job and I was very, very happy. She was happy. She came back a year later and says, doctor, they look very natural. Can you make them look a little more fake? And a little bulb went off in my head. I, and, and that's when I, there was like a turning point where I realized that it's not what I think is beautiful. It is what they want that's beautiful. So as long as what I do is safe and efficient for them, um, it doesn't have to be what I think is aesthetically beautiful. And I, and I saw, yes, I listened to my patients and I try to um, customize how I do procedures what I do for patients, how I do, how I do procedures. So, yeah. Is there any procedure that someone would come in and you, you'd say, oh, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't do that. Like for an ethical reason or for a different kind of reason that someone comes in and wants something that's just like, you're not comfortable doing. Has that ever happened to you? Absolutely. So we, we actually do turn away a lot of patients. Um, mostly it is for medical reason, not for psychological reasons. That's your, your, your question kind of implied is someone like they look crazy, asking for crazy things. That is very rare. I, I've, I can think of maybe two or three patients in my practice that I turn away for that particular reason. I had a patient once who wanted to have liposuction and I said, there's nothing to liposuction. Like you look great. She said, I'm going to gain weight so you can liposuction me. I'm like, no. Okay. I think this is where you put a stop. Thank you very much. I don't think I can be your doctor anymore. Uh, so we had to discharge her. But that's that's like one patient I can think of. There's maybe one other. Most often, why we turn people away is for medical reasons. Um, the most common one being uh, body mass index or weight. So a lot of overweight patients come to plastic surgeons. They think plastic surgery is weight loss surgery. Yeah, 
Plastic surgery is not weight loss. If you want to lose weight, you do it on your own or you do bariatric surgery like gastric bypass. And after you lost the weight, then you come to a plastic surgeon. Um, so that would be medical. And then sometimes we have patients that maybe ask for things that are unrealistic. Today in the age of social media, they see these filtered body shapes, which are anatomically impossible. And I tell them, you know what? I'm just a surgeon. I'm not a magician. There's only so much I can do. Interesting. So how many, per, like what percentage of people do you think you turn away in like a given month or in a given year? Uh, I, I looked at it a couple of years ago and we turned away 300 people. Wow. Which is, you know, I was thinking about that's 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 more than some surgeons operate on, you know, in the entire year. So we turned away about 300 patients um, that contacted us when plastic surgery and we said, you know what, like you're not either not ready yet. Uh, lose weight first or you need to you know your health needs to get in better or simply you know what you're asking for is just not realistic i can't do that for you it's interesting because when i when i look at your social media one of the things i find really interesting is that you talk about women who they exercise a great deal and no matter how much you exercise sometimes there's going to be excess skin and you can't fix that with exercise the only way that you could fix that you talk about is with surgery yeah so you know I, I post my work on, on social media and you know a lot of people uh, comment how nice it is and you all, all occasionally get the occasional person who makes um, um, an uneducated, uneducated comment such as, oh, why don't you just go to the gym and work out? You know, you could go to the gym. Well, the truth is there are certain things that no matter how much you exercise, no matter how much you diet, they will not change. A simple thing is if you lose a lot of weight, you, if you exercise, you, you tone your muscles, you lose fat, but your skin does not shrink. Um, if you're 18 or younger, it, it happens, but after 18, it just doesn't happen so much. And so you're left with a lot of loose skin. So massive weight loss patients that come for complete body contouring procedures, you have just tons and tons of skin that there's no magical way of getting rid of it, just you, you gotta cut it off. Uh, pregnancy, pregnancy changes women's bodies. There's no way to put it back. During pregnancy, your pelvic bones widen, so that not going to go back your abdominal muscles stretch out there's no amount of physio unfortunately that you can do to bring them back on the skin is stretched stretch marks form these are things that creams and and sit-ups unfortunately don't fix now let me be clear i tell my patients i'm not dissuading from from exercise absolutely live a healthy lifestyle plastic surgery is not a replacement for a healthy lifestyle but it's an additional help to make changes to help you correct things that you cannot do on your own, no matter how hard you try. Okay, I think that's going to be like a big learning for people because when I when I've watched your stories, I've been I've been like educated about that because I, I didn't I didn't know that before. So that that's very informative. <laughs> Plastic surgery obviously changes like over the generations. There's lots of technological advancements. Where do you think the industry is going to be in five years from now or ten years from now? Well, there's a push to more. More, more towards more safety, better efficiency, less invasive procedures. Um, fat grafting, using your own body fat to do all kinds of things and rejuvenation um, is, is, is a big thing these days. It's still early. Uh, we do a procedure called Brazilian butt lift. When you liposuction fat from around the body, put it into the butt, and that's great. You can also do the same thing for breasts, but not to the same extent. There's fat transfer to, to face, but it's still in its early stages. There's a lot, you know, there's a lot that needs to be worked out. Uh, but in general, it's about safety, improving safety, making things less invasive. Like for example, um, when, I, when I was a resident, we talked about, you know, something simple as breast reduction, patients would stay in hospital overnight. Today, we do it as an outpatient surgery. I do complex, extensive surgeries, really complicated surgeries in my private facility and patients can go home the same day. You know, th so things have advanced tremendously. Um, I do a complete facelift on an awake patient. You know, I just take the face off and it looks kind of gory. But yeah, with, with the technology we have today, with the surgical techniques, it can be done completely safely with minimal anesthesia. So those are the advances that I see getting better and better as time goes on. Are you interested in developing the technological advancements or are you more the type of doctor that's just going to implement the technological advancements? Um, I am not in a lab doing research. I am more of a person who's thinking of innovative ways of getting things done, um, uh, you know, pushing the envelope. Things that we do in our clinic, um, 
are maybe a little more advanced than you would find somewhere else, just because we keep pushing up and learning. It's, it's, it's an incremental uh, advancement. I do things today that I wasn't doing 10 years ago. So my practice has evolved. And I spoke about it earlier, being self-critical. Every patient is like a stepping stone to another improvement. Every, every time I do a procedure, I think of how we could do something even better. And, and that has evolved my practice from 10 years ago, which was very different than what I do now. Someone just said you're her favorite doctor. She loves your transparency. She just said, Iris just said that. Let, let's move on to social media. So you were one of the first plastic surgeons in Canada to use social media in such a transparent, to borrow Iris's word, an extensive way. And this got a little bit of a backlash for you because um, you were a forerunner. That often happens when people yes. are forerunners, they get backlash. But what's interesting is that everyone seems to be doing it now. So my question is to you, um, why did you gravitate towards using social media in the first place? Like, what was the impetus for that? How did that, how did that originate in your head? Um, since, a, since I was a little kid, I've always had interest in technology computers. I, you know, was looking, I, I built my own computers and all that stuff. So always been technological. When I started my practice, I was the guy that I, I made my own website. I was thinking on my website and I used my website to sort of promote um, plastic surgery, educate people about plastic surgery. When social media came about, at first I was a little, little kind of holding back. Um, but around 2016, I came across Dr. Miami. Dr. Miami, uh, people know is you know, one of the OGs of social media and plastic surgery. And I went to visit him to see what he does. And I'm, now Dr. Dr. Miami is very much into entertainment, and that's not me. I'm 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 not not a performer. Uh, it didn't fit me, but I realized that I could use social media to educate my patients because the the one thing that's persistent in every consultation is educating our patients. There's so many misconceptions about plastic surgery, so many misunderstandings, and patients, they're not doctors, they don't understand. They don't really understand what, what, what plastic surgery is, what human anatomy is like, what can and cannot be done. So it, it hit me that in social media, being visual, and plastic surgery being about appearances it was, it was a perfect mix to allow me to, to show what we do, to explain what we do, and educate patients. I, I truly believe, I mentioned before, but I truly believe that our patients are the most educated, most informed patients. And I can tell you from my experience from day one, when we had people come in for consultations, if they said that they follow us on social media, I knew it's going to be a completely different consultation. If I ask somebody, you know, do you, do you follow us on social media, they say no. That's going to be a long consult. But the ones that follow me, they knew what I was going to say. They, they, you know, we could like finish each other's sentences. They knew what I was going to tell them, how I was going to educate them. And I found it like, like an eye opener. It's like, yes, this is such an amazing, such a powerful tool. I love it. And I kept going with it. You know, I, I had a lot of backlash. Uh, my colleagues... Like I said, felt that it was very unprofessional to be showing surgery, to be showing naked bodies and what I do and bruising and all that stuff. Uh, I just felt that that they didn't didn't get it, and I, I think I was right because now they're doing the same thing. They've kind of jumped on the bandwagon, and and everybody's doing it. Everybody's using social media to educate patients and help inform them about what's going on. I know that you're a really mathematically minded person. So have you ever analyzed what percentage of your patients come through the door because of the social media? Uh, that's a difficult question to answer because people do all of research. So um, when, when we look at, when we actually do that analysis on our, on our practice, 80, 90% of our patients come through the website, Google. But at the same time, a lot of patients come to us, clearly have seen us, they follow us, they're well prepared. So they get the education from social media. And so people people now don't come from one single source. They go all over. They go on websites. They go on um, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, do their research, and then come to us. So I would say social media has been very helpful to help educate and prepare our patients. Is it really the source? Uh, I, I, I can't give, put a number on it, I can't tell you how much it is, but it's definitely playing a role in educating people because they are well prepared. They're, they're, I, I can't stress what a difference it is between a patient who's been watching our social media and a patient who hasn't when they come for a consultation. It's, it's like night and day. I want to talk to you about beauty. 
obviously beauty is in the eye of the beholder and beauty ideals change. They change in co- different countries, different cultures, different, um, you know, generations. There's this idea of the classic uh, golden rule of beauty, which is very defined by symmetry. And I, I just, I've noticed um, just like in social media, just looking at in popular culture that it seems that that classical ideal of beauty that I associate more with like the fifties and sixties has kind of shifted to um, much more sort of like extreme kind of, you know, um, I'm not even sure how to, how to, how to (laughs) define it, but it's much more extreme. It's not about symmetry. It's about exaggerated proportions. I'm just wondering if you could talk about changing beauty ideals and how you've seen that in your work, because you've been doing this for a while. Um, just speak to me about changing beauty ideals in plastic surgery. I I think you kind of summarize it spot on. Um, so there's such a thing as golden ratio. So for, for our viewers that don't know, golden ratio is this uh, ratio that you can find in throughout the nature, throughout the universe, stars, everywhere. And it, it, it seems to fit what we think of as beauty. There have been studies where you know you could show something to a little baby that has no preconception, no social influences, and they gravitate to things that fit the golden ratio. It's almost like it's we're genetically imprinted to to like this and um, um i would call myself a classical guy i like classical music i like classical art michelangelo is one of my my favorite artists um, his study of human form and everything absolutely love it and so yes when i look around and i see you know people like kardashians or Nicki minaj or madonna recently i don't know if you've seen madonna yeah. you, 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 you realize you know they don't really follow the golden ratio but as I mentioned earlier, you know, as a plastic surgeon, I realize that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. I'm not here to impose my beauty standards or universal beauty standards on my patients. I'm here to deliver on what they want as long as it's safe and reasonable. Um, and so what I do is I, I try to find out from my patients what it is that they like, what they think is beautiful, and try to deliver on that. Um, a little story for you. Again, earlier in my practice, one of those, one of those experiences that formed my, my philosophy and how I practice medicine I had, a, I had a patient walk into my consult room, and as soon as she walks in, she's a doctor in her, I want a very natural looking breast augmentation. I'm like, okay. She sits down, pulls up a picture of Victoria Beckham with these two balls on her chest. And that's what she called natural looking breast augmentation. Again, my light bulb went off in my head. I'm like, okay. So I realized when someone comes in and says, I, will look, I want to look natural, my answer <laughs> is, okay, show me what is natural to you. Yeah. And so my again, my goal is to, to create what makes my patients happy, not what I impose on them as a, as a beauty standard. Got it. And, and, and one so more thing, I, just, just I, to continue on that, is yeah. yeah, social media is warping beauty standards. Yeah. Because uh, message to all the followers out there, all the, all the viewers today, guys, what you see on social media is not real. Even if you have somebody who's like maybe an influencer who says they had surgery, almost never do they show you the real body. They always put filters, they tune, they pose, the lighting. Um, I'll, I'll tell you from my experience, my own patients, um, they look better when they take selfies than when I take a picture of them in the OR or in the recovery or in follow-up. Uh, stuff you see on social media is never the real world. And so patients see this, they see someone who had surgery and say, oh, she looks beautiful. I want, I, she got that look with surgery. Can I have that same surgery? And the answer is, well, I can do the same surgery, but unless, unless you use the same filter, you're not going to look the same. That's a really good point. I think that that's because you're right. It's become so unattainable, the standards of beauty through all these technological manipulations. And, you know, I have a light ring here. Like, you know, I just even lighting makeup, just yeah. all these different things make people look completely different. Right. I don't think the lighting, though, in your clinic, like it's medical lighting. So yeah. that obviously that's not going to be as good. Right. As like, uh, well, you know, it's, it's good. It's medically, medically correct. It's it shows the real person. It shows the real person. Okay, yes. fair enough. So if you're comfortable, I want to ask you some more personal questions. Okay. Um, just because um, we often see you at work and you're, um, you know, you're, you're, we don't get to know the real you. So um, one question I have for you that we've never talked about is, and I want you to try to be honest here, is when you're walking down the street... Or when you're like in a hotel or, you know, you're on the metro or whatever, the subway, do you, when you look at people, 
is it hard for you? Like, is it an occupational hazard that you look at them and like, hmm, you know, I would kind of like do this or I do this. Or do you just look at people and they're like, oh, like you're not analyzing them as a doctor, as a plastic surgeon. I just want to get, like look through your eyes to, to sort of see how you sort of take in the world and, and beauty in the world. Um, as a plastic surgeon, I think I see things that other people don't see. I, I almost feel like I have x-ray vision. I can see through the clothes. I can see the curves and the bulge and everything else. Um, so I, I pick up on things other people don't, but at the same time, I'm not judging. I'm not thinking, okay, she needs a tummy tuck or she needs a breast augmentation. That's not a thought that grows to my head, but, but I see things. So when, when someone walks into my consultation room, even before they get undressed, I kind of know what's going to be underneath. Um, so I, I would say, you know, I, I have medical plastic surgery x-ray vision, but no, I don't walk around the street looking at people thinking what plastic surgery I could do for them. A couple people had the same question as me, so I'm not the only one who had that question. I, I, a lot I've, of people, I've had that question a lot of people ask that question. Would you say that you are, now we're speaking about personal things, so for anyone who's just joined, um, we, we had an extensive conversation about the plastic surgery from a medical point of view and beauty and aesthetics and all of that. Now we're asking Dr. Yindenberg more personal questions. So would you say that you're an introvert or an extrovert? I'm an introvert. I'm totally an introvert. Um, that makes myself an extrovert when I need to be an extrovert. That's so interesting because I would think that you're an extrovert based on how you put yourself out there. So is it is it a, is it a sort of a push for you to do that, to get out there on social media, to do all the stories you do? Because you're, you're really online and you're really out there, I would say. Um, I'm, a, I'm an introvert and I'm a very quiet person, which is something you wouldn't get through my social media. I'm the kind of a guy that, you know, I don't, don't mean words and I, I, I don't talk a lot. I'm, I'm very quiet when I'm in the OR, I listen to music, I barely say a word. Uh, if you know me socially, I'm, I'm the quiet guy in the corner. But I, if I want to say something, I say it. So when you see me on social media, you see those little tidbits when, I, when there's something I want to say. So you see me talking in between, I'm quiet. Um, so. That's, that's where the introvert, extrovert comes in. I'm an introvert, but if something needs to be done, I come out of my shell and I get it done. Okay, interesting. I think I'm probably the same, probably the same as you. Um, what, what would you say is the best compliment that you've ever received? Um, I, I think the best compliment would be the one that I would consider as being an honest and real. Like, you know, when you go through things, you know, I see patients all the time, they all give me compliments, they say things. And often you you, you never know whether they're just being polite, you know, oh, this is so nice or thank you. It, it's when you really feel that it's a true, honest compliment coming from somebody that I would respect. Um, um, just think it pops to my mind. I remember when I was, when I was graduating from my, from my, uh, uh, plastic surgery fellowship in New York. We were at dinner, and one of my mentors, one of the surgeons, the world famous surgeon, was sitting next to me, and he had a few drinks. I was a little, you know, a little Lucy, kind of, and leaned leaned over and said, "You know, um, um, I I I I don't want this to get into your head, but I think you're one of the best surgeons I've seen." And you know, and that, and that came across really, really honest because I you know he was he had a you know a few to drink, so I, I I really that really got to me. Like I still remember that. Or there was other, you know, similar, similar situations when, when I get a compliment from a colleague who I respect, who I feel know what they're talking about, and I feel like what they're saying is honest, not just being polite and kind. What's the best compliment that you've had from a patient? <sighs> Again, when, when, when I do follow-ups... Um, People, you know, people say nice things and give me all kinds of compliments, and, and and they say things such as "You've changed my life," and I've heard this over and over and over for years. And I all, again, I always felt it was like just being polite um, and speaking to um, some patients and ex actually going a little bit deeper and them explaining how their life has changed made me actually realize that you know these are probably not just like polite words; they actually. I am changing people's lives, and 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 that kind of you know that, that's nice. Yeah, I I came from a background of cancer reconstruction, microsurgery, when I was you know saving people's lives and making them better to just you know make them look good. But realizing how important it is to feel good in your own skin um, is for people's well-being. One one that pops into my head right now, 
I did a labiaplasty for a patient. Now, for those that you don't know, labiaplasty is trimming excess labia. And people might think, that's crazy. Who cares? Nobody sees it. Like, it's so irrelevant. I did labiaplasty on this young girl. She was 19 years old. She came to her follow-up with her mom. And her mom said, uh, since the surgery, she's like a completely different person. And it really hit me like, you know, this is something nobody ever sees. This is something complete for her. But that little surgery, that little trim of little extra skin that nobody will ever really see, help her change her self-image, self-confidence. And I, and I realized like little things, I, I, even I don't realize what an impact it's having on my patients. So that, that made me feel great. Yeah, no, for sure. What, what would people say would be something that would be misunderstood about you? Because you you are kind of a little you're you're sort of a conundrum in the sense that you are you're quiet but you go on these rants and like there's there, there's a few people who have commented that they love when you go on the rants because they feel like they really get to know you. So what would people misunderstand about you the most? Would you say? Yeah, when I have my little rants, I, I come out of my shell and just speak my mind like little verbal diary. I guess, but um, I, I you know people see me people see me on social media. Uh, people that don't know me but see me on social media see me operating a lot they see me working crazy late hours um, and I, I think um, th there's a little bit of a misunderstanding behind my motivation of why I do what I do um, people make all kinds of assumptions why I work so much why I operate so much I'm in the OR all those late hours and the truth is is I absolutely love what I do um, I'm happiest when I'm in the OR. When I, when I bring my patients into the OR, I, I say, welcome to my playground. This is this is where I feel the happiest. I, I have the team that I work with that I love. I have music that I love to listen to, and I do what I love. Um, I work crazy hours, and I don't really work. I, I, I really play. I'm having fun. Uh, you know, there's a quote, if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. That's true. I don't work. I go, and I really enjoy what I do. I I don't count the days till it's Friday. I don't count the hours till I'm done. Um, I go in happy to what I like to do. So. I just read a study, and we, we talked about it um, this earlier when I spoke to you, and it, it said that plastic surgeons are the happiest of any medical specialty, which I thought was so interesting. So does that resonate with you? Uh, I, I don't know if you plastic surgeons are the happiest. I think I would say that the happiest people are the ones that love what they do. Yeah. Um, if you love what you do, doesn't matter what you're doing. You're going to have a great time. You're going to have a good time going to work. Uh, uh, I, I'm not sure where the, the study got its data, but I'm, I'm going to make a, an assumption here. Is The reason why plastic surgeons are probably the happiest is because plastic surgeons are able to to tailor what they do to, to make their patients happy. Uh, plastic surgeons often work in private settings outside of the imposing scope of a hospital or the healthcare system, which you know, unfortunately can be sometimes overbearing. And uh, when, when I talk to my colleagues, um, a lot of the frustration and unhappiness that comes in being a doctor often relates to hospital administrations. And so me being outside of a hospital, I don't have to deal with hospital administrators. I make my own rules. I have my own clinic. And so I'm happy when I go to work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes sense. Also, it's elective usually, right? It's not because of an illness or a trauma. Yeah. Um, I think that's probably an, another reason, right? Well, You're not dealing with... Um... I, I think, you know, even trauma or, or, you know, cancer surgery can be very rewarding yeah. if, if you feel like you're helping patients and if you love what you do. Uh, before cosmetic surgery, I did cancer reconstruction. Absolutely loved it. I loved being in the late hours doing microsurgery. I, I really, really did. And again, just like as long as you love what you do, it doesn't matter what it is, you'll be happy. Someone just wrote best plastic surgeon on earth. I don't know if you're seeing the comments. <laughs> or you're probably able to multitask really well. Um, tell me about the three most influential people in your life and how they impacted you. Um, well, I'll say it's not people, but I guess I'll say groups, I think. Well, number one with my parents. My mom and dad uh, influenced me to, and you know, made me what I am today. Um, um, I mentioned earlier, you know, the influence my dad had on me becoming a doctor and a surgeon and my mom's influence on, on you know, on who I am. Um, without them, I, I probably wouldn't be here being a plastic surgeon, that's for sure. 
Uh, next would be my mentors, the plastic surgeons that then took me and shaped me into what I do. Um, I've had the privilege of working with some amazing, amazing plastic surgeons um, who, you know, again, I, I, I think um, every time I think about what they've done for me, how they shaped my, my surgical techniques, my philosophy, how I do things. Um, so I'm very, very thankful to have gone through the training programs uh, where, I've, where I've been. And the final group will be my two girls who uh, are now, the, you know, all it's my, my whole life and they got me on their finger and just they're teenagers right now so they're killing me so I'm trying to survive that phase <laughs> understood yes I, I have friends with teenagers so I get it my kids are pretty young still so I've got, I've got a lot to look forward to I guess um, what's the, the biggest lesson that you have learned over your career The biggest lesson I learned, I think, is something I learned early on in my life. Um, um, and, and the lesson is there's no such thing as impossible. If you work hard enough, if you try hard enough, um, anything is possible. Um, you know, um, something we didn't talk about, but you know, I'm an immigrant. We were refugees from, from economic Czechoslovakia. And when we came to Canada uh, as refugees, it, it, was, it was difficult. And my parents struggled adapting, and I was a little kid. Maybe, maybe I didn't even fully understand the gravity of what was happening, and so I was like, you know, going about my life and just going on. But somehow, I was able to realize what was going on, and somewhere in that experience, I learned that working hard is going to make anything possible. And this this notion, there's no such thing as impossible became cemented in me in, in high school. I think it was, I was, I was working hard trying to, you know, master the language, you know, um, and, and getting to university. And then in university, I struggled. Um, you know, I had to work really hard to get into medical school. Um, so undergrad was probably the most difficult time of my life where I was working my ass off to, to, to make it to medical school. And this, this whole concept of there's no such thing as impossible became cemented in me, which applies even now, you know, having my practice, it's not an easy thing. It's, it comes with challenges. Sometimes I have to remind myself uh, when things look like they're really, really bleak, it's like, hang on, you've done this, you can take this. There's no such thing as impossible. Just put yourself together and keep going. That's great advice for anyone, I think, in any field, right? Um, any final thoughts to share? Um, I think along the lines of what I just said is, you know, there's no such thing as impossible as you know, um, when it comes to sort of professional life, find what you love and work at it. Go really hard. I've, I've, I was able to create this beautiful clinic I have, um, and I did it by the seat of my pants. I, I had a business. I had no business background. I, I, I was a doctor. I had a science background. I had no idea how to set up a clinic, how to do finance and marketing, all those other things. Um, and so I've just learned as I went. Uh, went through some rough patches, had some you know ups and downs, uh, but again, just keep keep pushing through. No matter what challenges you face, you, you just gotta keep working hard, um, stay stay the course, and be patient. It'll come. What's the best way to get in touch with you if someone is interested in a consultation or more information? So we are here on Instagram Live, so people can contact me through my my Instagram account, Real Doctor Six, Real D R S I X, or they can go on our website, TorontoSurgery.com. Pretty easy to remember. Uh, there you can fill out a contact form. Um, over here also, you can send me just a direct message, uh, and we we do our best to answer all the messages as quickly as possible. So I'm happy to answer any questions, any consultation requests uh, to anybody who contacts us. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. This was really really awesome. I really appreciate your time and I'm sure everyone else does too. And I hope to see you soon. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. And I'll, I'll save this. So, um, for those who've been watching, if you think a friend would like to see this or would benefit from the information, then I will post it. And, um, I think doctor, you'll hopefully you'll post it as well on your IG so that people could benefit from all the information that we shared. I hope everyone has a great night. Thank you much. And thanks for having me again. That was very, very nice. Thank you. Bye.